welcome everybody. Welcome to episode number 100 of Fraternity Foodie. I feel like there should be some confetti dropping down from the ceiling. I am your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University. As always, we call these episodes Fraternity Foodie because there is nothing like great food to bring people together. We are celebrating this milestone of our 100th episode with a longtime friend and a leader in the fraternal world, Will Foran. He is Senior Vice President of Campus Operations for the North American Interfraternity Conference. Will leads NIC Campus Operations and Education Initiatives designed to increase alumni, undergraduate, and IFC effectiveness. He establishes relationships with campus professionals as well as NIC stakeholders to coordinate a national education and advocacy strategy. Welcome to episode number 100. Will, you made it. Thanks, Michael. So good to be here and with you. Looking oh, forward to the time I've together. I've looking forward to this for a long time. I'm so happy that you're joining us. Um, I couldn't be more excited. So this is going to be absolutely fantastic for our listeners. I know, I know they're going to love it. So let's dig in. You chose Indiana University of Pennsylvania for both your bachelor's degree and also your master's degree. So we were wondering why IUP? You know, I think like many students uh, looking to go to college, it was the perfect distance of away from home, along with um, I was the oldest of three and the first one to go. So the right price and ultimately had the, the program I wanted, the, the right feel, love the campus, it was four hours from home, you know, just far enough, but just close enough for um, close enough to home to come home and do my laundry or come home for a weekend now and then, but also far enough away where mom and dad wouldn't do a surprise drop in. Uh, as my 17 year old self, so I, I thought that was a great idea, <laughs> but uh, turned out to be a phenomenal decision because I did, I stayed for my master's in student affairs and higher education. IEP, unbeknownst to me at the time, had a great SAHI program, still has a great SAHI program. And I had the unique opportunity to, you know, stay at IEP for my coursework, but was the, um, able to do my graduate assistantship at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. So I lived in Pittsburgh, about an hour away from IUP and commuted a couple times a week for classes and was able to work at a, in, a, in a great city. If you've not been to Pittsburgh or listeners not been to Pittsburgh, phenomenal city. Uh, and as a very different institution with phenomenal students. So perfect opportunity. It worked out very well for you, clearly. So that's, uh, that's great. And you joined Phi Mu Delta fraternity at IUP. What made this particular chapter so special to you? It, it really was the men. And I think almost anybody would say that. But uh, part of it was it wasn't a chapter at the time. It was it was a colony. So joining the the founding father group and being part of the first new member class and really connected with some of the the men starting the group and their ideals, what they were trying to do, and you know something different for the fraternity experience at IUP, and really really connected with those men before I really understood what you know what Find Me Delta was all about mm -hmm. and. Uh, turned out to be, again, a great decision, one that has definitely shaped not just my career, but my life in many ways. And uh, also to get in on the ground floor and help build the chapter. Uh, I was ultimately chapter president when we were chartered. Uh, so to help build that chapter, grow the chapter uh, into some initial success. Another successful founding father of a chapter. It happens over. There's and over way too many again. of us out here in the fraternity sorority world. There are so many. There's just something special. There's a magic about being a founding father of your organization, and I, I'm jealous. I will never be a founding father ever. <laughs> I wish I, I, I looked into it. <laughs> So, all right, so you started out as a grad assistant for Greek affairs at Carnegie Mellon. Then you went on to be assistant director at Mount Union and also at Western Illinois. So talk to us about the differences between all of these institutions as it relates to their Greek systems and then the student body. I'm wondering if, if that changed your approach at all for the job. Yeah, it absolutely did. And I, I think I had, a, I had a blessed and unique journey in many ways. Uh, starting at Carnegie Mellon, I was my first job. I was I was the Panhellenic advisor, 21 years old, straight up undergrad. Uh, worked with some amazing colleagues there, 
good, some great mentors and was advising Panhellenic, digging into the, and at the time it was, digging into a green book, the green book. Um, and I still remember vividly our, um, I graduated in May, 2001. So started that assistantship over the summer, get my feet on the ground and get really get ready for formal sorority recruitment, entirely new animal uh, to, to me and to my experience. And our information session to kick off recruitment period and everything was on September 10th, 2001. So a, in addition to everything else going on and trying to find my footing of what's it mean to be a professional and getting to know students and all of those, all of that, like really working with the students to how do we navigate this Pittsburgh being uh, very close to where, you know, 90 minutes away from where flight 93 went down students that having family from in DC in New York, uh, working with those students, phenomenal students to, to navigate that was a very early and impactful learning experience as many professionals who were around as, at that time had. Um, and then, you know, working with the students at Carnegie Mellon was just phenomenal because it is a very unique institution of where having students that are very talented in the fine arts and a very strong fine arts program and a very strong uh, engineering hard sciences program. And those are two populations that don't naturally coexist well, or I won't say don't coexist well, but two populations that have different views of the world, different mm -hmm. approaches. And watching those cultures come together and those students come together in chapters, phenomenal experience. And I think speaks to what the fraternity sorority experience is meant to be of, this is how we learn how to work with people. Mm -hmm and navigate difference. So starting out with those two years at Carnegie Mellon and then spending two years at Mount Union at Small Liberal Arts College in Ohio. You know, Ohio has a Small Liberal Arts College in every town, it feels like. Uh, and again, having some phenomenal colleagues, work with great students and some great mentors there that definitely shaped my journey. People I still stay in touch with. The community Mount Union was a small one. We had five IFC chapters. Uh, four Panhellenic chapters, mm -hmm. the and they were it was an old community, which I, I always found interesting. That the most recent fraternity expansion uh, was in 1918. Wow! So a very established old community that, uh, and again, students from the area, like a 200 mile radius of Mount Union. Uh, if anybody knows about Mount Union, it's a it's a Division three football powerhouse. Um, they, I think. Before I got there, they won five championships in a row. Um, and I was the bad luck charm because they didn't win one while I was there. But after I would <laughs> left, they won four more in a row or something like that. It's just ridiculous. Um, and just a great environment there. And then at Western Illinois, um, before I went to Western, I wasn't aware, but they also have a very strong college student personnel program. So having the experience, the opportunity to work with a larger community, uh, a large institution, uh, in good old Macomb, Illinois, where a lot of people go for two years and stay for 20. And it's having a, um, and this is where I think I've been so lucky to have just, again, great people to learn from, great colleagues, people like Dan Maxwell, who's now at the University of Houston, and Comerford, um, people who just good, solid professionals through and through, good teachers. Um, and at, at Western, be able to work with a community of nearly 30 chapters as well as with the student leadership programs. Uh, so spreading my uh, purview a little bit and also begin supervising graduate students. Um, I think that's one of the things I feel so lucky about is having through my three years at Western, three plus years at Western, uh, having phenomenal graduate students, people who are still in the field and still, still make a significant impact. People like Brandon Cutler at Purdue, Veronica Moore at Delta Upsilon, um, Michelle Marsh, um, and um, others as well that people that were students of mine that are still in the field, like Michelle Marchand at Delta Group Salon, mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Peterson at Sigma Alpha Mu was a student at Western. Uh, so having many people that through the journey have uh, been connected with that have gone to do and continue to do phenomenal work. Uh, I feel very lucky for that. So three very different institutions, uh, but um, things I think built upon each other uh, and despite different institutions, you know, you're working with students, students who want to have a positive experience, want to better themselves. And 
I find that the ability to build relationships with students and support them, that's the key no matter where you are. And yeah. listening to them, working with them, hearing their story, meeting them where they are, that's the key. And those are the constants. Mm -hmm. Well, your students love you, so uh, well, I will tell you that firsthand. <laughs> you have a gift. There's no question about that. Now, you started working for uh, the North American Interfraternity Conference back in 2008. At that time, your focus was really on education, mm -hmm. and you worked on curriculum design for the NIC signature programs. So we're talking about UIFI, Impact, Futures Quest. UIFI, I have to tell you, even as an adult, when I was helping to mentor undergraduate students, that was a life changing experience for me. Like the trajectory of my life completely changed from that moment forward. So I'm wondering from your perspective, what makes these programs so successful and why do they continue to stand the test of time? Yeah, and I remember working with you prior pre your UIFI experience and post your UIFI experience. And you're right, it was like a light bulb went off yeah. um, and just phenomenal. You know, I think the, uh, the, the thing with UIFI and programs like UIFI is it's the experience that brings students from divergent backgrounds, diverse campuses, diverse experiences together in one setting for a, uh, very, I would say an intense experience, but a experience that is focused on the individual long days, we're working together, we don't know each other, so we're forced out of our comfort zone uh, and all there for the same reason. We wanna better ourselves and better this thing that we care about. Um, it, it speaks to the, the value of the, you know, the in-person institute style leadership experience. And that's not unique to higher education, fraternity and sorority, it's like, it's the same thing you experienced at an outward bound or the, the off-site retreat for your company to a different degree. But I think the real value to UIFI is we all care about the same thing that we're really passionate about. We've opted in and we are, we don't know each other. So we're forced to let our guard down a little bit, be our authentic self. And we're not held back by, I'm afraid of what so-and-so is going to say about, or how, what would I say here as I come back with me to campus? Like this, in many ways we talk about is, it's like this utopia place. Of how do we recreate that elsewhere? And I know others have tried that too, but um, there definitely is, you know, secret sauce and magic to just that bringing people together and getting them in the same room for the same goal. And then you almost you almost have to buy in because if not, it's gonna be five difficult days. Right. We'll wear you down eventually. <laughs> I wish the critics of Greek life would go through UIFI because what I see with my eyes at UIFI is just phenomenal. The transformation is real in the students. The transformation was real for me. Just like you said, it really was a light bulb moment that I was like, oh my God, this is what fraternity and sorority is really about. Um, and so I'm, I'm just so grateful to have that experience because uh, well, it just made me a better person. My good friend, I'd say our, our good friend, uh, Rick Barnes, who used to do some speaking, former colleague. Uh, Rick and I used to joke about, and, the, and he's now gotten involved in politics uh, locally. And Rick and I used to joke about, he's like, you know what, I think we need to send Congress to UIFI. Um, and this was five, six years ago. Uh -huh. So we're, but I agree. I wish, I wish the critics could see that. I wish uh, more could experience it. And it's, it's harder today than I think ever because the pace around us is so fast. It's hard mm -hmm. to get five days or four days a way to really dig deep and invest. So um, I wish, I agree with you, I wish the critics could see that. I wish more of our uh, students, and I'm not saying this is self programs, I wish, but most more of our students uh, and colleagues could engage in that and had the time and the opportunity to engage in that. Yeah, I completely agree. If anyone's listening and you've never been to a UIFI, please consider it and go and check that out because it's absolutely incredible. Um, and we're using lingo, I would say, UIFI, the Undergraduate Interfraternity yes. Institute. Um, <laughs> and this, this summer is supposed to be our 30th summer. So we're excited for uh, some new, new things to come there moving yes. forward. And of course, you can check that out on the NIC website for more information. In uh, 2013, now your focus starts to turn to campus relations and operations. So talk to us about the challenges of advocacy when you have 74 different organizations and 350,000 undergraduate members. I know that this is challenging because I was in the room. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's not easy. It's definitely a challenge. And 
part of my intention and in, uh, seeking to make that move within our team and really, really grateful for the opportunity to do so is, and to still stay involved with our educational programming was asking myself the question and thinking about what, a, what am I passionate about moving forward? And part of that was, how do we help elevate and, and improve the relationship dialogue, continue to improve that between all of the stakeholders and partners, students, campuses, headquarters, uh, the IC member organizations? How do we continue to elevate that? How do we do a better job of walking together, of, how, of, of working with each other, hearing each other, talking to each other, not past each other? And you're right, it's hard. There are, you know, under, the NIC membership, it's a big tent. I tell students all the time, think of your IFC uh, and how hard some of those conversations are and expand that to the national level and triple the size. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard. It doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Um, we often say it's a big tent uh, and there's room for honest conversation, debate, and really authentic dialogue. And I think we we continue to do better at that. We have to always try to do better at that. Um, and yeah, so we have a lot of member organizations and we have a lot of different viewpoints, but we all care about the same things mm -hmm. at the core. It's like, and how do we elevate this experience? So there's a big tent, but there's lots of room for agreement in that big tent and there's room for disagreement. And it's, it's an honest debate and that's, that's healthy. We shouldn't be scared of that. Uh, but there's, and there's another layer too. Of we, we work with and represent students that are on over 550 campuses across the country, across North America, and campuses that have uh, different boards they're working with, different perspectives, different local conditions, different communities, different needs. So it really is, uh, there is no one silver bullet. It really is putting in the work, building relationships, not just think, Talk about really building relationships with students, but building relationships with partners and peers so that uh, while we may disagree, we still trust each other. We know where each other is coming from. We seek to we seek first to understand. I have found that that is very critical and a key part of the philosophy that we share with our team uh, and how we move forward of seek first to understand, and then we can build from there. Mm -hmm. um, without doing that, we, there's no way we can be successful. And that includes internalism among the membership, but honest debate, understanding and continue to think on the big picture of we're all in this together. We all want the same things, strong fraternity experiences that in positive impact the lives of students. We make it their different ways, but we want the same thing. Yeah. Well, I'm proud of you and I'm proud of the entire team at the NIC. I know it's not easy, but uh, it's needed and, and I appreciate all the work that you put into it. Uh, well, I have to tell you that. Um, and you've spent a lot of time on these three NIC presidential commissions they were uh, misuse of alcohol, hazing, sexual assault within higher education, and of course the fraternal experience. So I'm wondering over the years, what progress has uh, been made in these particular areas and what challenges remain? Well, I'll start with the challenges. I think the, the challenges remain is that our population is always turning over. It's always generally gonna be 18 to 22 years old. Mm -hmm. And 18 to 22 year old men are um, inherently, going to struggle through learning about learning the same lessons over and over again. So it's how do we make progress and how do we put students in a position to better govern themselves and better manage their chapters and communities? That's where, where, where real change is going to happen and giving them alternatives. Uh, accountability is important. Programming education is important, critical. We can't do without those things, but it's got to start with students caring about their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been a real perspective shift of we've really focus more on that self-governance, that peer governance approach. And it's not perfect. It comes with its challenges because we, again, always continually need to work to build that. And sometimes it does may, or may feel like we're taking one step forward, two steps back, or hopefully two steps forward, one step back. But I, I think a big perspective shift has been invested in focusing on that. And we're going to have challenges with alcohol, we're gonna have challenges related to rites of passage and how, do, how are those appropriate and safe and, and meet the needs of, of men who are seeking to prove themselves as an adult or to prove themselves to other men. Um, that's, that's ingrained, that's, you know, that goes back thousands of years, that's not new. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we're going to have to continue to work on those. That's well, part of working with this population, but also it's not a fraternity, sorority, or fraternity specific concern. These are cultural challenges. You know? So we're also, and I don't say this to diminish our own responsibility, but we're also working within a larger campus culture or larger, larger culture within society about alcohol use, healthy masculinity, um, hazing, sexual misconduct. And that's one thing that we learned is we really dug in on these things, brought in experts of, yeah, the, like we have work to do and we're going to continue to do that work. But also part of the work then the focus should be of how are we enhanced and impacting the campus communities uh, positively here. And, and these, are, these are hard things to do. There's no, I used this term earlier, but there is no silver bullet and solutions are local. Mm -hmm. um, every campus is unique. Every community is unique. Yeah, there's global strategy, but situation or solutions are gonna be localized and they have to be owned by the people who are there. They're not gonna listen to you and I. They don't listen to the old folks as much as they listen to their peers. So it's how do we enable that conversation with good mentorship, good alumni support. So it's a little bit of philosophy shift there, mm -hmm. but one that we've seen some good inroads on, but it's slow progress. Yeah, I love it. All right, so here's one of my frustrations. As you know, I'm a huge champion of Greek life. I love fraternity and sorority life. Um, and sometimes the message about the benefits of association don't always filter all the way down and through the media and things like that. So for example, recent research has shown that fraternity and sorority members benefit from significantly more engagement than non-members, which is especially helpful during the pandemic that we're facing right now. And the study also showed greater gains in learning. Uh, so we're talking about satisfaction with their college experience. So to me, it seems like this is perfectly aligned with the goals of our host institutions. And sometimes we struggle to build awareness on all of these positive outcomes of fraternity and sorority life. So talk to us more about this recent study. And I'm just wondering, how do we get these studies out to a larger population and spread the word so that way more undergraduates have the same experience? Yeah, great question. The, the recent study is great, partly because it's a um, reapplication or resurvey of a previous study done by Dr. Gary Pike at Indiana University. And I remember reading Pike's work when I was in graduate school and like, this is great about the, the value of being involved in organizations, the value of fraternities. Um, so Dr. Pike redid that study just, just in the past year, it reaffirmed and showed strength and stronger findings about the value of fraternity experience, including especially among first year students looking for connection, looking to plug into the community, looking for their people. You're, and you're right, it, it, it aligns perfectly with the mission of host institutions, the goals of host institutions, which is what we strive to do. Uh, the, the challenge is the research is phenomenal and it speaks clearly to the value of the fraternity experience, but, you, but and you know this too, the, the personal experiences, some which are really great, some which may not be so great, speak stronger than data. You know, I was, I'm a, my undergraduate degree is in political science. And my, uh, one of my statistics professor, one of his favorite quotes was, uh, we can't use, in, in reference to the class and statistics, you can't use statistics like a drunk uses a lamppost. They're for support, not illumination. Are they for illumination, not for support? And I was like, God, I hate that quote, but it's so right. Um, so, the data is extremely valid, extremely important, but it works so much better to tell a story mm -hmm. when it aligns with what people are seeing. That's not to say it doesn't work when it doesn't because it tells a story and it tells a story at a very broad level of, this is generally what happens. They're more impactful when they align with what people are seeing. So yeah, we have a challenge on our hands of how do we get the, what people are seeing to align with what the statistics say. And that is a dual pronged approach. That is, we need to continue to push out this story. Uh, and how do we get people to see it? Part of it is getting, getting it published in peer reviewed um, art journals. Uh, and that's, a, those things are always in progress. And, you know, those are lengthy processes, um, but we need more research, more research that rather than a handful of good studies, 
more research that sheds light on and illuminates the good story of fraternity uh, and, and the impacts of the fraternity experience. How it helps with uh, students with mental health, helps with their connections, their success inside and outside the classroom, about the value of the single sex experience. Um, to, to answer those questions and show that um, on the whole, yeah, there are challenges and we need to address those and we are committed to addressing those. I don't think anyone says they aren't, but on the whole, this is an experience that is extremely valuable for, for many students and that it, it positively impacts the lives of students as undergraduates and far beyond. Mm -hmm. And so I want my dogs. Sorry about my dog. <laughs> we love the dogs. Dogs are great. <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. We both agree that we want to improve diversity and inclusion on college campuses. So I'm wondering what steps has the NIC taken to address racism, intolerance, and hate on college campuses? Great question, and, and Oscar down here next to me, he agrees, he's barking along <laughs> with you. Um, the, you know, the NIC formed a task force over the summer, so in June, focused on this exact question, diversity, equity, inclusion. What can the conference do? Uh, being mindful of the conference's role as a trade association. So the opportunities that come with that uh, in working with uh, all of our member organizations. So the conference is actually, and this is great timing because you know coming up in a few weeks, the conference has a special meeting of members where we're gonna vote on some standards related to diversity, equity, inclusion, discuss a position statement related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're also working really closely with our partners right now to roll out an entire suite of resources and tools for IFC officers and campus communities on diversity, equity, inclusion, and very targeted resources, not just a officer's manual, but targeted tools and resources of how do you have a conversation as a community about um, microaggressions or power and privilege or inequity um, so really targeted tools and resources to help shape and support community conversations there because these are difficult things to address as a community and we want to we want communities to address them we want to help them but also we want students who want to do that to feel empowered and have the tools and resources necessary to have a successful not just dialogue but then follow-up action uh, as a community again at the student level because that ownership is so critical so that's the, that's, that's the start. We're gonna obviously need to continue doing work in this area, but we've been clear from the beginning that you know, there is no place for uh, acts of intolerance or all racism in our communities and clear about, clear about that, made that statement very, uh, very upfront uh, and now continuing that work. And yes, it's, it takes time and it's going to take time, but it's work we're committed to doing. Yeah, I'm so happy to see that rolling out. That is fantastic news for me, and I'm sure all of our listeners as well. That's really good. And I'll also, put a time frame on it. I expect it to be rolled out January, February. Beautiful. So for coming soon, uh, uh, unlike the movies that are supposed to be coming soon for the last eight months, coming soon. <laughs> you heard it here first, Q1 2021. So that is good news. That's very, very good. Now, some listeners might not know this about you, but you were installed as national president for Phi Mu Delta fraternity recently. So what are some of the things that you want to accomplish now as national president for your fraternity? Yeah, it's uh, a great opportunity. I have a great board that we're working with as well. So some great brothers on that board. And I've been a volunteer for Find Me Delta and with the Find Me Delta Educational Foundation since I graduated. So lucky to have this opportunity now to uh, come back to the board, lead the board. And we're actually going through a strategic planning process right now as a fraternity. And Find Me Delta is a small organization, uh, but we take pride in the personal touch that uh, we provide it as an organization to our members. And, you know, just this morning, I was on a call with a, a Zoom call with a group of alumni from the 70s from one chapter, a handful, that they've been getting together monthly on Zoom. Just checking in with them was so much fun. Um, our priorities are, we obviously want to continue to focus on enhancing that graduate experience. Um, part of that is Finding Delta has its own DEI task force uh, that they're working on, that we have a committee, a board-led committee working on to uh, look at what we are doing and what our priorities are as an organization. And we have a lot of pride in our history, founded in 1918 during a pandemic. We've referred to that a lot in the past few months. 
uh, but founded in 1918 as one of the first fraternities to accept men regardless of race, race ethnicity, or creed. Um, and looking through our history, and there's been some ups and downs in that history related to some of our DEI work, but uh, taking pride in that history and continuing to um, be, be progressive and forward thinking and an inclusive organization. That's important. Uh, continuing to serve uh, serve our members at all levels, provide a good fraternal experience. Uh, part of because we're small, like, I talk regularly with our chapter presidents um, and I'm able to attend chapter meetings regularly, our executive director, um, Tom Murphy, he knows most undergraduates by name, which is phenomenal. Uh, I don't know how he does it, we're lucky to have him. So, um, And part of what we need to do as a small organization, which is not a surprise, is continue to work on our governance model. Effective board governance is hard, just doesn't happen. You need to tend to it. Uh, so we're, we're doing that too. So a lot on our plate, but exciting times. Yeah, small fraternity, but you guys are growing and you're doing phenomenal things. So all the credit in the world to you, to Joe, to Tom. I mean, you guys are just doing phenomenal stuff. So uh, I'm proud to be a, a friend of Phi Mu Delta. I've been to your conferences before. I've yeah. met your undergraduates. They are incredible and they are, they're they there for the right reasons. Yeah, and that's we're lucky to be some great about. undergraduates, great alumni uh, and great friends of the fraternity. Yes, yes, of course. Now, you know, just looking back at it, you've impacted so many undergraduate students over the years uh, in their development and their commitment to being their best selves, which is really to say that they're staying true to their fraternal values and the oath that they took when they joined the fraternity at the altar. So I'm sure you've seen your fair share of blueprints over the years. Uh, and the hope is, is that the students will now go back to their campus, make their communities better with all of this new information that they're getting from the NIC and of course, all of our great volunteers. So are there any special moments that stand out to you where you were just really proud of the work that your students accomplished? Yeah, and there's a lot. Um... And some are blueprint related, like coming out of an educational program, whether it's an impact at a campus or a, a UIFI and seeing the growth of a student. One of the, some of the coolest stuff is when you work with a student at a, at an, at a UIFI, they come back a year later as the, the intern and the student coordinator, that continued growth and that continued engagement. Because one of the hardest things being at the NIC is in some ways you lose that opportunity to have long-term so connections and relationships with students uh, as you as 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 you do as a fraternity sorority advisor you know, as a fraternity sorority advisor you're able to so you meet some students when they're new members and you're like their whole journey or like early on as a chapter officer through journey as a ch chapter officer council officer you don't have that as directly but seeing that growth be able to have like little check-ins here or there but also i think about some of the the ifcs we've worked with and on some campuses that traditionally have some very challenging communities or char challenging characteristics, communities that have worked, worked through some tragedies and seeing over time how those communities have adapted, how they've grown, how they've taken some of the most difficult situations, scenarios you can imagine uh, and grown through that. And it's not been a straight line growth. It's been you know, sometimes a step forward, a step back. But that resilience and seeing the growth of individuals who have stepped up in those situations. So maybe not relate to the blueprint, but the people who have challenged themselves to meet the moment and then some, I, that always um, reinforces why, for me, why we do this work uh, and makes me feel good about future, the future generations, the generations that are stepping into their careers and ultimately a leadership uh, in their communities uh, in the years ahead. Um, I think of a, you know, I'm not gonna out any community here or any specific IFC, but there's a few that really stand out and they know who they are. Um, and I feel lucky that over my past decade now, can I see you've been able to, and I've told a lot of them this, seeing that progression in their community or their chapters over time. Um, or, it's, or it's really cool when when I was doing UIFI three to four sessions a summer, seeing students from, every, from a chapter come year after year and seeing that quality uh, and development of those students, different students from the same chapter progress dramatically year over year over year. 
uh, and attri then attributing that to UIFI or to things they were doing. That was always just really encouraging to see and something we see a lot. Yeah. That's beautiful. All right. So I love seeing all of your photos of your grilled meats that you're making at home. I think that's fantastic. And I know you've also spent an awful lot of time in Indianapolis. So other than St. Elmo Steakhouse, which everybody is like, that's you gotta start to. with. I mean, you gotta start there, right? But other than that, where else do you suggest that I go to get a great meal in Indianapolis? So Really, your you, a safe bet is any of the St. Elmo affiliated restaurants. Okay. You know, if my wife and I want a nice dinner in Indianapolis, we're gonna go to St. Elmo or one of their affiliated restaurants, Harry and Izzy's, the 1933 Lounge, for example. But if you, but depending on what you want, there's a lot going for Indianapolis or for listeners out there. Next time you're in Indianapolis for a conference, because Indianapolis is a great city for conventions, any conventions, not just fraternity sorority related conventions. The uh, there's some great places though. Uh, outside of fine dining, I would say, you know, the Eagle on Mass Ave, fried chicken, phenomenal. It's, it's, they're based in Cincinnati, so you're in Cincinnati, look them up, or Indianapolis. Um, Condado, tacos, very good. Um, there's also a few off the beaten path places that are hard, hard not to recommend. If you want, if you want a good burger, uh, Check out Working Man's Friend. It's outside of downtown. It's an Uber right away. Make sure you take cash. It's that kind of place. <laughs> but it will be probably one of the best burgers you've ever had. And you might be, when I say take cash, five bucks might be enough. It's that kind of place. Phenomenal. Um, we, we now live up in Noblesville, so a, you know, northern suburbs of the city. Uh, and luckily, when we moved out of the city, we're concerned. Like, we're going to miss a lot of our favorite places. But sure. they've moved up as well. Um, so there's lots of great places here over in the suburbs. I take a look at, um, don't be afraid to take a look at the mom and pop places that are in some of these suburbs and small towns outside of Indianapolis. Uh, lots of places you can't go wrong. And the smokers are pretty much always on. So next time we're up here, we'll, uh, we'll happy to throw, throw some meat on the smoker. Yes, let's do it up. I absolutely love it. So those are some great suggestions. That will keep me busy for at least a semester. <laughs> to my trips to Indianapolis. I think that's great. So you have certainly lived up to the billing. I tell you what, this has been great. This has been a ton of information. So I appreciate you spending the time. If anybody has any questions for you at the NIC, or perhaps they need more resources for their local IFC, what is the best way to connect with you? Easy. Uh, and I would say, I'm going to give you an email address for our entire team. It mm -hmm. goes to me, but it goes to our entire team. And one of us will our commitment is we always get back to people in 24 hours. So campus at nicfraternity.org will go to myself as well as our entire campus support team. Uh, my direct email is will.horn, nicfraternity.org, and our phone number is on our website, 317-872-1112. That is fantastic. So there you go. So if you need a contact at the NIC, you have all the email addresses, campus at nicfraternity.org. That will take care of it. They're going to respond to you in 24 hours. Beautiful. I love it. Super simple. Thank you so much, Will. I, I have to tell you, you're, you're a great friend. You're a champion for Greek life. So I appreciate all the work that you do for the NIC. I appreciate all the men at FIMU Delta, of course. So please send my regards to all of them. And uh, just keep on doing what you're doing. I, I'm so proud of you and uh, I'm honored to be your friend. Same here, Michael. Appreciate all you're doing, the work, the, your, your friendship and partnership. And I appreciate all the work you've been doing. So keep it up as well. Will do. All right. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy the holidays. And we will see all of our listeners on another episode of Fraternity Foodie. Bye for now.